Changing from Persona 3 is more important than you think. Let me explain. Despite not having as much screen time or presence as the other party members of the game, the impact he had on the characters and narrative was bigger than almost anything else, and had Shinji not been a part of the story, then things would have turned out a lot differently. I'm even willing to say that Cease would not have been victorious in their battle against the Dark Hour without him. What makes him such a good and important character you might ask? Well, let's start from the beginning. First and foremost, Shinji gives a different perspective on how someone deals with regret, death, and sorrow. Since he's a special case, where he himself killed someone else by accident, it's an interesting premise that's much different than what most of the other characters have gone through or end up going through in the narrative, and it slowly builds up more and more as the game progresses, and I'm sure you can figure out what I'm alluding to. He runs away from his problems by abusing persona suppressant drugs, and basically tries to kill himself to atone for what he did. He's more or less the most extreme example of the themes of what the game is going for, which are death, depression, regret, stuff like that. Despite this, he is a genuinely good person. He just made a mistake that he could never take back, but just like everyone else, when the time calls for it, he's willing to step up and help. For example, Shinji from the very start plays a vital role in rescuing Fuka from the Dark Hour, who would become one of the most integral pieces of the team. He's the one that protected Yukari, Junpei, and the protagonist from the punks at the station outskirts, and then gave them information on the status of Fuka before the full moon. Had Fuka died, the game would have been over right there. Without her analysis abilities, they would have struggled way more, and almost certainly would not have made it to the top of Tartarus. So even as early as June Endgame, he indirectly saved seats. And just as a small bonus, he does so again in the movie adaptation during the Justice and Chariot Arcana fight, where he saves them from poisonous gas in the underground bunker. This dynamic of his desire to protect and help people, plus his regret and essentially suicidal nature, is why he has the Hierophant Arcana. And yes, it's the Hierophant, not the moon, it does not matter what the portable social link is. The Hierophant in many decks can represent a bridge between heaven and hell, law and freedom, and they're mostly teachers of wisdom. The bridge between heaven and hell can be represented by the dynamic I mentioned a moment ago, and Shinji definitely acts as a teacher of wisdom to the group both directly and indirectly, which I will go over in detail in this video. An example of this is his relationship with Akihiko, where he knows he's coping with the past just like him, but in a different way. Another reason he has this arcana is because of the way he runs away from his past. He lets it weigh down on him and pushes others away even when they might need him, which makes that dynamic troublesome since there's definitely a conflict of feelings there, but that's what makes him an interesting character. Throughout the entire game, his thought process is that he has to pay for and atone for what he's done like I've been saying. So when he hears about Ken joining Cease and being a Persona user, since he killed his mom, he joins back, knowing that he can't run away from the past anymore and has to confront it. This simultaneously acts as his way of atoning for it as well, which he more than likely knew was going to happen. He knew it wasn't a coincidence that Ken ended up obtaining a persona and joined Cease. He knew that it was fate, and he knew he was trying to run away from things all this time. So even though it might seem that on the surface he doesn't grow or change much as a character, he absolutely does. A lot of it is just internally and unspoken. On top of that, he also changes in the linked episodes of Reload as well, where his growth is exemplified. Shinji's growth through the linked episodes and Reload really does add on to what I've been saying actually because he respects and cares for the protagonist a lot and knows he's only telling the truth when they speak, which makes the relationship one of the best in my opinion, at least in terms of the linked episodes. Shinji and the protagonist are pretty similar in the sense that they're both straightforward people that don't take any BS from anyone and always keep it real. This is why when he tries to get the protagonist to help him run away from his problems by giving back the extension form for school, the protagonist is like, uh, fuck nobody, you're either keeping your promise to graduate with Mitsuru and Akihiko, or you're doing it yourself, which he actually appreciates a lot. It's also why he confides in the protag about the fact that he's going to die soon, which leads to this whole conversation. I know it seems like I wasted your time, but it's the good memories that stay with you and get people through their struggles. But it's also the mistakes you made that haunt you forever. I gotta use what time I have left to set things straight. I don't have the luxury of doing anything else. Oh, damn. You really don't mince your words, do you? But you know, that ain't so bad. It's way more refreshing than having someone keep quiet because they're scared of hurting my feelings. This conversation allows me to segue into the actual significance of Shinji, and why he's one of the most important characters in the game. 
Not only does he represent what the game is trying to represent and tell the player almost perfectly, but he also changes the lives of every single member of Seas. Everything stems from the events of October 4th. Yup, every analysis is going to talk about this, and obviously Shinji is no exception. Like I said, Shinji knew this was probably going to happen. It would be wishful thinking to believe that Ken joining Cease was a coincidence. Yet despite this, he still agreed to meet with Ken alone on October 4th, the anniversary of the day he killed his mom. Of course, one of his main goals was to have Ken not end up like a murderer just like he did, but if he did end up being murdered by him, then he wouldn't have tried to stop him. Do it. I won't stop you. You're right. I just wanted to forget. That's why I left everyone behind and tried to use the drugs to suppress my power. But nothing I did could erase the memory. No matter what I do, I always end up back here. Neither of them could have guessed that Takaya would ambush them though. And honestly, it's hard to tell for sure how things would have ended up if he didn't do that. But the fact that Shinji was willing to protect the person who was planning to kill him shows his willingness to atone for what he did, and he would do just that by getting shot twice just to protect Ken, which would eventually lead to his death. But before he passed away, his final words are vital to this conversation. This is how it should be. This is how it should be. I'm not sure even Shinji himself would know how accurate that would be because his selfless sacrifice changed everything. So let's talk about how exactly this is the case. In the protagonist's case, it's worked a change inside of him to really value his friends more in the time they've had together. I'm also certain that he blamed himself for this considering he's the leader of the group, and it was also the voice of Shinji that he heard before he performed his own ultimate sacrifice by sealing Nyx. All right. Let's do this. In Yukari's case, since her main objective, besides learning the truth about her father in the experiments, has been to protect people from dying. So this is a moment that hits her hard. She might not have known Shinjiro very well, but his passing and everyone's responses to it afterward are something she would think about a lot thereafter. I'm certain that this raised her resolve even more to protect those around her. For Junpei, he's a bold guy who fears death and he respected Shinji a lot. He learns a lot from his passing, and he thinks back on Shinji's last words and whether he'd be able to say the same thing he did. It opens his eyes to the reality of what they're fighting for, and it helps him to mature greatly, which would give him the strength to fight for and protect Chidori even more, even if it would cost him his life. Just to show how much he respects Shinji, look at how he defends him during the ceremony. Shut up. Huh? What are you getting up for? I said shut the hell up! Mitsuru changed a hell of a lot after the passing of Shinji, especially with the added context of the linked episodes. With the knowledge of the promise to graduate together and what Shinji went through after killing Ken's mother, that alone would have been enough to hurt her deeply. But of course there's more than that. She blames herself for not noticing what was going on sooner with Ken joining Seas and then being absent for the full moon operation and it pushes her to pay more attention to those around her and to not neglect the ones she cares about. Akihiko? Well, I mean he changed a little bit, you know, nothing crazy though. Nah, seriously though, Shinji's death changed Akihiko's entire life and mindset. He finally realizes what Shinji was trying to tell him all along, which is that he's been so hellbent on strength because he's running away from the past. He neglected anything and anyone around him for the sole purpose of getting stronger, but now he understands that his pursuit of strength was just a coping mechanism for the death of his sister Miki. After his death, he would devote himself to see things through to the end for the sake of those he's lost. Fuka's entire awakening stems from the passing of Shinji. Despite whatever those around her would try to tell her, she still blamed herself for the passing of Shinji, but past even that, it changes the entire way she perceives the bonds and relationships she has. She feels like she's been taking the time they have together for granted, and eventually resolves to reconcile her relationship with her parents after talking with Natsuki. It also helps her to realize the true strength of her persona and self, which is to bring people together. I guess this case is a lot more low-key, but if you ask me, through everyone's grief and emotions around her, it actually affects her a lot. 
She might not show it and she might not even realize it, but the death of Shinji and everyone's responses would grow to become cumbersome for her emotionally over time. I guess never had a true understanding of how the death of someone close could affect people, especially since she never saw herself as grievable, since she could be replaced in her eyes, but this event showed her the reality of it. It's why during the decision of whether to kill Ryoji or not, she wants them to kill Ryoji and forget everything. She's seen how fear and despair can hurt people over the course of the game, and doesn't want to see it happen again, especially to the protagonist whom she loves more than anyone else, and it all started on October 4th with Shinji's sacrifice. For Ken? I mean, really what didn't Shinji do for Ken? Shinji sacrificing his life for Ken gave him closure in a way to the revenge he thought he wanted and gave him basically the best outcome possible from it. It gives him a second chance at life with a new perspective, and he slowly learns to live without regrets and tries to make up for all the things he's been doing wrong. He honestly becomes one of the more mature characters in the games in terms of mindset thanks to Shinji, and gets to just actually, I mean, live. Oh, don't think I forgot about you, Koromaru, you good boy. I obviously cannot speak dog, but I'd be willing to argue that Shinji's sacrifice affected Koromaru deeply as well. He and Koromaru have a pretty close connection because Shinji used to cook for Koro on the side, and they spend a bit of time together. So yeah, October 4th hit Koromaru just as hard as it did anyone else I'd imagine. And for Shinji himself, just to cover all the bases, he got to atone for the past and quit running from it, he got to prevent Ken from becoming a murderer just like he did, and he changed the entire game. So his sacrifice affected everyone of course, I've made that painfully clear by now. So what did the impact of this on everyone all lead to? It would lead to everyone slowly but surely gaining the strength to face death in the final arc of the game, which would lead to everyone helping Igis herself awaken and see herself as more than a machine. I really don't think it's a stretch to say all of this either. I really don't think the game would have ended as well as it did without Shinji's impact. Remember, at the very least, Akihiko, Fuka, and Ken only gained the strength to face Nyx after his sacrifice, so even if they resolved to fight Nyx on December 31st, I don't think they would have been strong enough to win in the end without their improved power and resolve. You could argue that they technically didn't win anyway because they had to seal Nyx, right? But remember what I said about the protagonist? I truly think a large portion of why he gained the strength and will to do what he did was because of Shinji. I mean, come on, the last person's words he hears before he performs the great seal is Shinji's. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that he had an impact on that choice at least a tiny bit. It honestly is insane how important Shinjiro is because he genuinely does have the least amount of screen time of any party member and is by far the most reserved and stoic character of the team, but plays one of the biggest roles possible. It's why a lot of the discussion was on the impact he had rather than himself. I mean, think about it. Some of the most important shit to happen in the game only happens after his passing, more than I've even talked about here in this video. With that said though, I do think Shinji himself is an absolutely stellar character. He represents the themes of the game perfectly, the conclusion to his character is one of my favorites in the entire series, and his character arc is short and straight to the point. In a game full of deep and intricate characters, it's nice to have a character as straightforward as him. Not to say he isn't necessarily deep or intricate, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say. What else I hope for is that you enjoyed this video because folks, we have reached the end. Again, Shinji is an amazing character, and I hope this video helped you gain a deeper appreciation for him, since honestly I don't see much love for him. I'd love to hear what you thought about our discussion today, or how you feel about Shinji in general, so please feel free to drop some comments. I tend to read and respond to most of them, and if you enjoyed it, why not consider dropping a like and a subscribe? I'll even give you a free virtual cookie. Here, it's on the house. Also, if you're wondering why I didn't talk about Shinji's persona in this analysis as I usually do, it's because I already covered the story of Polydeuces and Castor in Akihiko's character analysis video, so if you would like to get some more insight on that, then please check that one out. It'll be at the top right of your screen now, and it'll also be on the end screen of this video. I got nothing else to say other than that. It's been your boy Yandere Gogeta, and I will see you in the next video. Peace out everybody, and have a great day.